Hello and welcome to the World Future Energy Summit. Today, our Back to Business webinar is Stimulating Economies, Low Carbon is Business as Usual. This will look at advancing low carbon strategies, targets and policies in different industries right up to the city level. Our Back to Business webinars have been running throughout this week. Yesterday, we discussed the circular economy of waste and on Monday, the new energy economy. Both can be watched on demand if you miss them. Tomorrow will be our final webinar of the week, which will look at decarbonizing water. My name is Rob Jones, Content Director for the World Future Energy Summit, and joining me are Dr. Greg Clark, Global Advisor, Cities, New Industries and Digital Transformation at HSBC, Nicholas Howarth, Research Fellow at CAPSARC, Bruce Smith, Director of Forecasting and Planning at EWEC, Alain Smith-Gillespie, Associate Director of Advisory Services at the Carbon Trust, and Adrian Doolan, CEO of, the, of Green Touches and a board member of Global Compact Network, UAE. During this webinar, we'll look at how organizations can decarbonize their business. Our intention is to highlight how companies large and small can take the steps that make a difference. And these are actions that will increasingly shape the future and longevity of a company. And I'm not just talking about investment decisions and potential stranded assets here. We've seen the youth movement for climate action over the past few years, and they are the future consumers, employees, managers, directors, owners, and company founders that could disrupt your business. So we'll explore approaches that traditional industries are taking and those of smaller companies making incremental changes. We'll look at how organizations can work with their supply chain to reduce their emissions, some of the technologies being used to make a difference and how smart and sustainable cities can adopt these approaches. If you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, use the message box below your video window. Keep them brief and we'll get to them at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, Bruce, turning to you. Now, I'm, I'm going to turn to, to, to you because you're obviously, as I said, the planning and forecasting director for EWEC, the Emirates Water and Electricity Company. How, for, for you as an essential service, how do, do companies or power and water companies start to think about their carbon reductions? Where do you see the biggest low carbon opportunities? Thanks, Rob. Well, e EWEC's mandate is to ensure primarily security of supply with a parallel objective of least cost. But we're in the very fortunate position at the moment that there's a happy alignment between a significant reduction in uh, carbon emissions associated with delivering the least cost portfolio. So just by applying uh, and developing a least cost portfolio, we expect to see a reduction in CO2 emissions from around about 43 million tonnes a year last year to around 20 million tonnes by, by 2025. So within the next five years, we're going to see over 53% reduction in CO2 emissions. Now, partly that's a, a, as a consequence of intro introducing four large nuclear reactors, but we're also introducing a lot of uh, PV. We've got the lowest cost of PV in the world in this region. Um, and I, I would fully anticipate that the next project, we're going to see um, PV costs below $10 a megawatt hour, which is um, the cheapest energy available anywhere. Um, in addition, we're also seeing um, the implementation of reverse osmosis or membrane-based desalination technology. And water at the moment is responsible for around about 40% of all of the gas uh, consumption. So at the moment, we're basically using gas to produce water with boiling water. That technology is changing and it's far, far more energy efficient to use reverse osmosis. And we're gonna see an associated uh, CO2 intensity re reduction from around about 13 kilograms per cubic meter to less than one. That's over 90% reduction over the next 15 years. So there's a remarkable change in terms of uh, CO2 emissions just associated with our normal day-to-day -day business. And that's before we start to consider the, the impact that introducing uh, utility scale storage, which is likely to happen at some point in the next few years. I'm not, I'm not going to peer too deeply, deeply into the crystal ball, but it's going to happen sooner or later. So, I mean, to summarize, there's a, a happy alignment between decarbonization at a fairly, uh, fairly dramatic level uh, and delivering a least cost portfolio. But the challenge from, for us is to how, to how to manage that system and maintain security. So that's, that's another question entirely. 
Yeah, and interestingly, actually, I read a few days ago, actually, I read that uh, Emirates Global Aluminium has said that they'll now start using their smelters uh, or their smelters will start to be powered by the solar from the Mohammed bin Rashid uh, solar park in Dubai, which, again, I think is a, is a change we just couldn't have imagined a few years ago. Um, indeed, the sorry. No, no, carry on. I said, indeed, the opportunity for integrating a larger system, um, whether that's through integrating industrial demand, like like uh, an, um, Emirates Global Aluminium in Dubai, or um, just just increasing the size of the uh, customer pool that we serve, gives an opportunity for increasing the amount of low carbon energy product, uh, low carbon energy production like PV that we feed into the system. So the bigger, the better in terms of the opportunity for increasing the amount of renewables in the system. So Bruce, now you're working uh, as EWEC, you're working on a renewable energy certification scheme. And I, I guess, I don't know how strong the link is there with the cities as we talk about cities, but it's very much for, I guess, for, for solar and, and, and looking at, uh, uh, well, explain it please, the, the renewable energy certification scheme. Well, I should say that this is a project that's been led by the Department of Energy, not by EWEC. But the idea behind this is consistent with uh, renewable energy certificate schemes that we've seen in other jurisdictions, which is simply to say that a number of customers are interested in demonstrating that they are using clean energy. In this case, it will be produced from um, solar PV. And it, it would be allowing those customers to say, we're prepared to pay extra for that, which in turn will help us as, as a procurer of that energy to increase the proportion of renewable energy in the, in the overall portfolio. So you know, the, the additional value that, that that clean energy brings to the system, we can utilize that value and put that back into the system planning uh, to enable us to increase the, the build out rate of um, proportion of renewable energy in the overall system. So you know, the idea would be that there will be certificates associated with the energy that is produced from, say, the one gigawatt solar plant that we've, we've recently commissioned and the one and a half gigawatt uh, plant, plant that's uh, under procurement at the moment. And that energy effectively would have associated renewable uh, certificates that would be available to customers for purchase in the future. Does, would it include small scale solar as well? So distributed solar, maybe uh, CNI solar, that sort of thing? Well, typically, uh, customers, and there wouldn't be customers if they're self-generating using distributed generation, are going down the distributed generation route because they're interested in reducing their costs or they're interested or and they're interested in, in reducing their own emissions. And typically, distributed generation is more costly than, uh, than, than utility-scale uh, solar plants. I mean, we're seeing solar at less than ten dollars a megawatt hour one dollar cent per kilowatt hour it's very hard to do that even on industrial scale rooftops at anything as anything close to that level of cost and unless you're going off grid and avoiding the transmission and distribution costs associated with bringing all energy to that plant and almost none of them are um you're, you're not actually doing anything apart from preventing the utility providing uh, renewable energy uh, from a large-scale plant. So uh, we're, we're, we see a greater opportunity to increase the penetration of renewables from utility-scale PV, particularly where you can manage the control. Bruce, I want to ask you, now I know that you have talked a lot and passionately about the use of uh, re increasing use of renewables in terms of with water, increasing RO. And you said, you said earlier, actually, that there's a point that is not easy, but fairly achievable in terms of reductions. And then after that, it gets really hard. So is, is net zero feasible for electricity and water, particularly when it's a critical sector? Well, it's not feasible at the moment within the context of a least cost system. So net zero is not, would add a significant cost to our mandate at the moment of minimizing the cost of supplying electricity and water to everyone. But I think I think our, we, we have an opportunity as the utility to play a role to, to inform government about what the cost would be of achieving net lower, net low or, or net zero, if you like. So 
we are in a much better position to provide that that insight, that understanding to the key decision makers about what would it take and when do we think that cost might change? What's that trajectory look like? Because at some point, I suspect it will be impossible or affordable to make the decision to say, yes, utilities can be net zero and that the premium of that, that um, associated with achieving net zero is a price that society as a whole is willing to pay. But that isn't a, a utility decision, that's a political decision. Um, but we have that role of, in, of informing government and in, in informing the decision-making about what that cost is likely to be.